On April 11, 1965, weather equipment in the top of a tower in Tecumseh, Michigan recorded several wind patterns that would lead meteorologists to conclude that two strong tornadoes passed nearby that day. An event like this would make for an interesting story in itself, but by the time Palm Sunday ended that year, more than 40 tornadoes had touched down and over 250 people were killed. But unlike so many natural disasters whose only legacy is death and destruction, the Palm Sunday outbreak would help usher in the modern era of severe weather communication, and the lessons learned that day would help save countless lives in the decades to come. I'm Jason, and Michigan, this is your story. When it comes to covering a major meteorological event like the Palm Sunday outbreak, there have been already a lot of fantastic documentaries on this topic, and they do a great job of capturing the personal stories of those who lived through the event. But since the ultimate legacy of this outbreak is all about communicating severe weather, I wanted to approach this tragic day through that particular lens. In 1965, the organization that today we call the National Weather Service did exist, but it was called the Weather Bureau. Like today, the Weather Bureau was part of NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. When it comes to researching a meteorological event, the National Weather Service seems to have all the data, but it's not super easy to find. With the case of the Palm Sunday outbreak, many of the forecast offices in the regions affected had written summaries of the event, and each summary had a piece of the puzzle. A 500 millibar chart here, service observations over there, and well, maps of the tornado forecast, well, they were just somewhere else. It was not until I found the complete report with some quick internet searching magic that I actually get all the important pieces, but more on that process later. To start this story off, let us take a look at the forecast from Michigan that is included with the Detroit News on April 11th, 1965. According to the newspaper, this forecast was provided by the Weather Bureau. The weather chart shows a cold front which triggered the outbreak moving through the region, and the detailed forecast begins with showers becoming occasional thunder showers after daybreak Sunday and ending by early evening. For a more detailed look at the meteorological setup for that day, we can start with a surface observation chart for the morning of April 11th. A warm front was moving northeastward across the region that would be hit by the storms. The dew points south of the warm front were quite high, indicating this air mass also contained large quantities of moisture. Warm, moisture-rich air is a great fuel source for storms of all kinds. The cold front off of the west, leading a mass of dry, cool air, would be the trigger of the storms. To see another contributing factor, we need to look at the 500 millibar chart. This chart measures wind speed and wind direction occurring higher up in the atmosphere, well above ground level. In this case, we are talking about 5,460 meters, or a little under 18,000 feet up. The key feature here is this area of high-speed airflow called a jet. It is a feature that nearly every report on the outbreak highlights as being important. I'm not going to pretend I can fully explain the relationships between jets and severe weather, but research as early as 1955 indicated there is a correlation between this phenomenon and strong storms. The first tornadoes touched down a little after noon local time in Iowa. And as the day progressed, tornado forecasts were issued across the Great Lakes region. Here is Tornado Forecast 71, which was one of the forecasts issued that day. It was issued at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and if a tornado forecast looks familiar, it is because this particular product is almost identical to the modern tornado watch. It defined a region and time frame in which there is a high risk for tornado development. The Weather Bureau's report from the outbreak indicates that four tornado forecasts were issued that day three of which overlap some portion of Michigan. The first tornado to strike Michigan occurred around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, just as tornado forecast 71 was being issued. This one carved a 30-mile path out by Grand Rapids. The last tornado in our state touched down around 8.30 p.m., bringing the total count to seven for Michigan, according to this report anyway. As time went on, the number of confirmed tornadoes for this event would rise by a little bit. With daybreak on Monday, the extent of the damage became clear, but the death toll would rise over the next few days. The outbreak had several stories featured on the front page of the Detroit News and New York Times on April 12th. The Detroit News front page reads, State Twisters Kill 38, 200 Mile Swatch of Ruin. Among other stories on the front page of the New York Times, the headline reads, Tornadoes Kill 150 in Midwest, Sweep 6 States. On Sunday, the Detroit News had a reporter covering an event in Indiana, and that reporter wrote an article describing all the damage they had seen on their way back home. One line in particular from this article reads, As we approached cold water, the glow became a huge flame from a building burning ahead. Everywhere the evidence of a deadly twister became more apparent. 
The tornado that inflicted the damage described by the Detroit News reporter was the same one that moved north of Tecumseh. Over the next few days, as the cleanup from the storms continued, the death toll slowly ticked upwards. On Tuesday, April 13th, in regards to the Michigan tornadoes, the Detroit News story headline reads, Tornado wreckage attacked. Push giant cleanup job as toll rises to 43. On Wednesday, the Detroit News lists the death toll as follows. Indiana was at 141, Ohio had 54, Illinois 7, Wisconsin 3, and Michigan's climbed a bit more to 46. The total death toll at this point was 251. In the days after the outbreak, two damage surveys were performed that would have a lasting impact on tornado meteorology. The first survey was conducted from the air by Dr. Ted Fujita. The research papers that he wrote following the Palm Sunday outbreak, as well as many of his other meteorological research, is available online as part of the Texas Tech University Special Collections Library, which is part of the Texas Digital Library Project. In his research paper titled Aerial Survey of the Palm Sunday Tornadoes of April 11, 1965, Dr. Ted Vujita writes about the Tecumseh tornadoes, which were recorded in his aerial survey map number 11. The combined tornado path of J4 and K3 on this map is between 2 and 3 miles wide. Some houses between Devil's Lake and Round Lake were badly damaged. Devil's Lake and Round Lake are the two lakes that surround Manitou Beach, Michigan, which is off to the west of Tecumseh. He also points out the wind measurements that provided the clue that this devastation was caused by two separate storms. A wind tower operated by the Tecumseh Health Study Project north of Tecumseh survived, recording a 150 mile per hour wind from the west at 1907 CST and a 74 mile per hour wind from the south at 2004 CST. Another paper written by Dr. Fujita, estimated wind speeds of the Palm Sunday tornadoes, includes the wind chart I opened up the video with, as well as a radar echo of the two supercells. Finally, if the name Fujita sounds familiar in regards to tornadoes, his most famous work, the Fujita or F scale for measuring tornado strength based on the storm's damage, was partly based on these damage surveys. A modified version of the F scale called the Enhanced Fujita or EF scale is still used today. The other damage survey was performed by the Weather Bureau's teams. The details of these tornadoes and the damage they caused can be found at the end of April 1965's collection of storm reports published by NOAA. Some notable comments include, there were 1,026 buildings and homes damaged throughout the four counties, cars, trucks, and boats demolished, tossed and carried aloft in the air for several blocks or more. Reports indicate there were two tornadoes. The report lists the death total at 44 and 612 others injured. The path of destruction was 70 miles. During my research, I found a video that claimed to be the home video of the damage inflicted in Manitou Beach, Michigan by these tornadoes, but I have no way to verify if that is what is actually being shown. A link to this video can be found in the show notes. The important legacy of the Palm Sunday outbreak is all about the lessons learned by the Weather Bureau. Now, at the start of this video, I talked about their report of this event, and this is a story of how an internet search trick helped me find the missing data. One of the write-ups by a local National Weather Service forecast office had a link to a PDF copy of the report, but that particular link did not work anymore. However, since the link had a file name of the PDF file, I was able to put that file name into Google and the correct link to the report came right up. This report, called Report of Palm Sunday Tornadoes of 1965, was delivered in early May of that year and is broken down into several sections. The first section provides an introduction to the objective of the report and asks the question. A post-analysis of early April 12th indicated that the Weather Bureau's tornado forecast issued on April 11, 1965 were excellent. Yet the reported death toll was already approaching 200 and still rising rapidly. Why? A little further down the introduction, the excellent forecast statement is backed up by this fact. This is plainly evident from Figure 2 and the fact that 33 of the 37 reported tornadoes occurred within the forecast areas. Sections 2 and 3 of the report provides a list of recommendations on how to prevent such a high loss of life in future outbreaks. Well, the last section of the report contains many charts, graphs, and data about the meteorology of that day. Back to the recommendations though, this is the most important part of the report. There were a total of 10 recommendations and a quick summary of them would be improving communication of severe weather information with the public, with the media, and with other forecast offices. An accurate forecast is the first step in communicating the threat of severe weather. Making sure the public understands and receives these warnings, well that's the second step. Let's take a look at some of the challenges and solutions presented in this report. In terms of getting warnings to people outdoors, the Bureau recommends a widespread adoption of a strategy in use in Tornado Alley. 
Civil Defense Sirens will be repurposed as a severe weather warning system for people who are outdoors. One can probably make the argument that this is the most iconic change, because at least around here, the Civil Defense Sirens are commonly referred to as Tornado Sirens. Getting warning partners severe weather information in a timely fashion is also important in getting the warning out to the public. While the comments about media partners were only positive in this report, the Weather Bureau wanted to ensure they could get the warnings as soon as possible by using the latest technology. Having people understand and appreciate the risk of severe weather is a separate problem. Some math in the first recommendation shows how easy it is for someone relying only on personal experience to not respect a tornado watch. During a watch, only about 2% of the area will be within 5 miles of an actual tornado. Also, warning terminology is only effective if its meaning is understood. The report notes this challenge. Very few of those interviewed in tornado affected areas were aware of the difference between a tornado forecast and a tornado warning. Even more concerning was the following line. The warning was generally interpreted as a just an updated statement of the tornado forecast. Many of the remaining recommendations deal with the communication between the forecast offices as well as having the public report back to the Bureau. The development and maintenance of a spotter network is important to verifying and improving forecasts. At the time, not all offices had a radar installation. Until all of them could get a modern WSR-57 radar, procedures were developed to transmit radar images and data between the offices. This included using phone lines to send images. Finally, surveys should be used to determine the effectiveness of warning messages. This recommendation begins. The survey undertaken as the basis for this report provided considerable value information. Taking surveys of the general public is a great way to find out of whether warning messages are being received and understood. In addition, advice from professionals in other fields should be used to help improve warning messages. When it comes to measuring the impact of these recommendations, it is not straightforward. Ideally, we would like to see a rapid decrease in tornado deaths after 1965, but we don't see that. In the United States, according to NOAA, tornado fatalities relative to the size of the population have been decreasing at a fairly consistent rate since the 1930s. However, the number of years of triple-digit death rates started dropping fast. In the 20 years prior to 1965, eight years had over 100 fatalities from tornadoes, which is about the same number of occurrences in the 50 years since the outbreak. In addition, it would take the 1974 super outbreak with close to 150 tornadoes and the 2011 super outbreak with over 300 tornadoes to produce years with higher death totals than 1965. Plenty of smaller outbreaks similar in size to the one discussed today have occurred since Palm Sunday of 1965, but it would seem in these cases the message about the threat of severe weather is being received. We are not there yet, but maybe in the near future we can see a year with no fatalities from tornadoes, or maybe another super outbreak in which no one loses their life. With that hope, our journey back to April 11th in 1965 is complete. You can find all my research in the show notes of this video, and feel free to provide any information you have on the event. Once again, I'm Jason, and Michigan, this has been your story. Thanks for watching.